Good morning and welcome to Worship at Wycliffe on this, the 31st day of July, 2022. As we gather for worship, we continue our series called The Quest. Today we'll talk about reflection, and next week our quest will conclude. This past Wednesday, a number of Wycliffians gathered in the fellowship hall to help load a U-Haul truck full of well over a hundred boxes of clothing, hygiene kits, food, and books bound for those in need on the eastern shore, specifically bound for migrant workers there in both Cheriton and Parksley, Virginia. Thank you for all those who donated items to this mission project throughout the course of this year. Your donations and your generosity is greatly appreciated. Wycliffe will host a blood drive in coordination with the American Red Cross on August 11th. Visit AmericanRedCross.org to sign up and reserve your time to give the gift of life. With that being said, let us pray and prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Gracious God, your Spirit is everywhere, on every path. You, God of life, you put into us human beings the imprint of your image and your likeness, and you made us to participate with you in your creation. Give us eyes to see and joy in our hearts to travel the journeys before us. Amen. As we come to our scripture reading today, we hear from the prophet Isaiah, a prolific writer. Isaiah is a prophet. He speaks for God, or better yet, God speaks through him. And so when we hear the words of the prophet, we hear God's word spoken directly to God's people. We pick up Isaiah's prophecy in the 65th chapter. If we were to flip back a bit, we'd see that Chapter 60 through 62 talk about the year of Jubilee when things are forgiven and things are looking up. Chapter 63 to the beginning of chapter 65 talk about the day of God's wrath and judgment. You see, part of the prophet's role, in addition to speaking for God, is to call the people of God to repentance. It's to get them back on the right track. And so if we were to start reading at the beginning of chapter 65, we'd have a very different picture in front of us because it's not until chapter 65, verse 17, where our reading picks up, that we pick up with the promise that the prophet offers to God's people. The words of judgment have been spoken, and now we pick up with God's promise. Listen for the word of God. I am creating new heavens and a new earth. The weary and painful past will be as if it never happened, and no one will talk or even think about it anymore. Take joy and celebrate with gl unending gladness for what I am creating. I'm making this place I've chosen, this Jerusalem, a city of joy. I'm making her citizens, my people, a people of gladness. Though you listen at every corner, you'll never hear crying, despair, or grief. Never again will a person not live a full life, for the young will live to be a hundred. People will confidently build houses and make them their homes. They will plant vineyards and enjoy the fruit without worry that they will be driven out. My people will live as long as these age-old trees. They'll use whatever they make and never work for others who take it all away. They will not lose their children to sudden terror and death, for they are the offspring of those blessed by the Eternal. They and their descendants will enjoy God's blessing. I'll anticipate their prayers and respond before they know it. 
for even as they speak, I will hear. They'll all eat together like friends, wolf and lamb, lion and ox, the biting snake will feed on the dust. And when that day arrives, there will be no evil, no violence, no hurt or wrong in all my sacred mountain, says the Lord. Here ends our scripture lesson. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we continue on the quests of our lives, in all of our journeys, in all of our travels, give us again your vision for a glorious new creation. Remind us of your promise. Your promise that is good even to the end of the age. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. My friends, our quest continues. You'll remember that that word quest is the root word to our word question. A quest is something that seeks. A quest typically involves travel, and when we travel, we meet people and experience things that might be different for us. There's an old story from Egypt in the 4th century, really old. It goes like this. I traveled once on a pilgrimage to Rome. Here, I was told of a celebrated recluse, a woman who always lived in one small room, never going out. Skeptical about her way of life, I, a great wanderer, called on her and asked, Why are you sitting here? To this she replied, I am not sitting. I am on a journey. The journeys of our lives, each and every one of us, often call us forth from our homes, from our our places where we have made comfort key. But there are some who travel without movement without movement, without moving. Even so, when we travel, we have encounters, chance meetings that sometimes change us, and when we see and experience life in a different way, we find ourselves wanting to reflect. How do we reflect? Well, there are many ways. Some people prefer to reflect by sitting down in an armchair and thinking. Others go by the water with a pad and write or sketch or draw or paint. Still others knit. There are many ways to reflect. But when you hear that word reflection, if you're like me, you probably think of a mirror. Maybe you think of a rear-view mirror like in your car, as do with traveling after all, and you look at it frequently. What do they say in driver's ed classes every seven seconds or every eight seconds? You're supposed to sweep the mirrors and, and glance and see. When I first thought of a rear-view mirror, it gave me kind of a negative connotation as if I'm looking in the rear-view mirror at the place I left and it's getting smaller and smaller. But we use mirrors in a lot of ways. You also check that rearview mirror to make sure that a car is not coming up right behind you when you're about to change lanes. And in that way, you're using that mirror both to see what's behind you so that you can move forward. Or think about the mirrors that we get ready in front of on whenever it is that we're going out somewhere. We're getting ready for the future by looking in the mirror. 
when we travel and when we encounter people, when we're on a quest and we consider what it means to be us and who we are, we are called to reflect. We look in the mirror at ourselves and we wonder, how has this encounter changed me? Has it at all? How is it, as we travel and go through the journeys of our lives, how do we reflect the future and not merely gaze in the mirror to see the past that once was? Reflection is fuel for the future. Nostalgia is love of the past, and reflection, though, allows us to see the past sometimes more clearly than when we were in the midst of the encounter and gives us a chance to move forward. Throughout these years of ministry, as I've worked with pastors and pastoral caregivers, counselors, chaplains, one of the cornerstones of our work together was a, a written weekly reflection. While that reflection attempted to be as open and as broad as it could be, there were some guiding questions. What significant event had an impact this week? How did that impact make you feel? How did the event or the individual that that had an impact how does that inform who you are does this experience inform your self understanding does the experience you have remind you of any scripture lessons any stories from the bible any psalms or songs movies these are all windows into helping us make sense of the things that have happened in our lives. Reflection is so very critical. Yes, the past shapes us. What we experience shapes us. And in reflection, we attempt to use that as fuel to move forward into the future. One scholar writing about the prophet Isaiah's words noted that it sounds like a utopian vision, this new creation that God has promised. And yet, God's promises all through Scripture have come true. So when God makes this promise through the prophet Isaiah to us to create a new heavens and a new earth, to fill that place, that new creation, with a people of gladness. That promise is as good for us as it was for Isaiah and the people he spoke to so long ago, and it will be good for our children and our children's children as well. It is part of human nature, I think, to, to look at this and say, well, that sounds like this, again, this utopian vision. We all have our, our ideas of Shangri-La or the Sunnybrook Farm or whatever it is that is that perfect place. But here's the thing. As God makes the promise for this place and God keeps his promises, the new creation that is promised can only be made by God. I used to live in Kentucky. There's a community in Kentucky where there lived Shakers. It was a utopian community of sorts. They attempted to make it as perfect as possible. Of course, there was one problem. They had st strict rules against procreation. So, so no matter how perfect they made that community, it died out. God alone can make this 
happen. This utopian vision from Isaiah. But friends, as we travel and experience the world, maybe we begin to see a little bit about how God is working to make this happen, even now, even when things seem so out of control, when things seem so abnormal, so strange, when the temperature keeps rising and the humidity keeps going up, when illnesses keep coming onto the horizon and never seem to go away, when communities continually struggle. It would be easy to look at all that and be struck with a sense of fear. And for some, travel evokes fear. Rick Steves noted travelogue. says, fear stifles compassion. And that is oh so important to remember. Fear stifles compassion. When we're afraid, we tend to be less likely to help or to feel with other people. What does is, what is he suggest instead? Well, as he says, in his numerous commencement addresses to those graduating from college or high school, do not be afraid. He sounds like the Bible. He repeats that message over and over again. Do not be afraid. Sometimes, when we travel and when fear gets the best of us, it's reflection that puts it back in its place so that we can enter again with compassion into a world so desperately in need of kindness. Travel reminds us, journeys remind us, quests remind us that despite what we're told, we are not the center of the universe. God is, and God promises not only to be with us, through every season and journey of our life, God promises us that He is working to create a new heavens and a new earth. We can get stuck at home in a cycle of busyness that continues to spin up and up and up, and it feels like life is moving at an increasing speed, like a runaway train. You know what the first first and maybe most important thing to do if you see a runaway train coming at you? is to get out of its way. Reflection takes us for a brief moment out of the speed of life and helps us to rediscover Christ the Center Christ who promises us a new heaven and new earth where crying and despair and grief are no more, where children grow to the ripe age of a hundred, where men and women work and produce and keep the fruits of their labor. as we travel and make sense of all the encounters of our lives, we use reflection to reconnect ourselves to Christ the center, to rekindle the compassion within our hearts. And friends, we fuel a glorious and wonderful future like God has promised. One that is not bound by divisions, but one where we recognize that everyone is part of God's glorious kingdom. The writer of Revelation alludes to this. 
when he writes, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. This week, take a moment to reflect on the travels and journey of your own life. Take a moment to reflect on the encounters that have shaped you. And as you reflect on those things, refuel yourself to go out with compassion and travel near or far to share God's goodness with the world. Amen. The idea of a quest or pilgrimage has long been a common spiritual practice. Early Christians journeyed to Jerusalem to the site where Jesus was crucified and resurrected. As the faith expanded around the world and it was no longer practical to travel to Jerusalem, substitute pilgrimages became popular along with the realization that the journey itself often provides as much spiritual growth as the destination. A quest, or hero's journey, has four main features. First, the hero decides, or is forced, to go. Second, the hero undergoes hardship and challenges and meets a mentor with guidance. Third, the hero undergoes change. And fourth, the hero returns home with new insight, never to be the same. A journey of faith is quite similar. A lifelong process, we face challenges with our faith. Mentors appear through biblical examples, teachers, our pastor, and as our faith is nurtured and grows, as we study the scriptures and increase our prayer life, we become closer to God, and our lives are never the same. There is a prayer Like a wide river It never ends Does not begin Around the world It's always flowing And I am stepping in We are stepping in We are praying in distant places, different languages and faces, every hour of the day. And we are praying with enemies and strangers, in gratitude, in danger, calling God's ten thousand names. There is a prayer, like a wide river, it never ends does not begin around the world it's always flowing and i am stepping in we are stepping in it never ends does not begin around the world it's always flowing and I am stepping in, we are stepping in. We are praying with those in distant places, different languages and faces every hour of the day. And we are praying with enemies and strangers in gratitude danger, calling God's ten thousand names. There is a prayer, 
like a wide river, it never ends, does not begin around the world. It's always flowing, and I am stepping in. We are stepping in. There is a prayer like a wide river. It never ends. Does Let us pray. O oh God, you are the Lord of the wind and the sea, of the mountains and the valleys of the world and of the church. In the midst of fear and insecurity, give us trust and hope in you. We live in a world, O oh God, where the gales of power blow strong enough to shake life itself, where from the arrogant and the interests of the powerful roll the waves of injustice and violence. We pray for those suffering because of their poverty, their ignorance, their limitations, because of their color or status, social or sexual. We think of your church sailing on a sea and all the waves and the wind that blow against it. God, take care of your church and put in it a sincere love for those who suffer, a clear vision of your wi will, healing, pastoral words for the needy and a valiant prophetic proclamation against those who create violence and pain. O oh God, rebuke the uncontrolled wind of terrorism and war. Turn it toward peace and human development so that in the place of lies, truth is strengthened. In the place of weapons, there are schools for children. In the place of luxury, the world adorns itself with bread for the hungry and life blossoms everywhere. As we pray, O oh God, for your church all around the world, we remember your church in this community. We pray for our neighbors, the strangers down the street, and everyone we meet. For those who grieve this day, O oh God, we lift up your promise of an end to grief and a comfort that is deeper than words can express. Give us time to reflect on our lives. And so, O oh Lord, calm us into a quietness that heals and listens and molds our longings and passions, our wounds and wonderings and wanderings into a more holy and human shape. O God, Lord of the wind and of the sea, may your strong mercy calm the whole earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray the prayer now that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, as you go out from this place, reflect on your life. Refuel yourself with God's grace, with God's kindness, with God's compassion, and go into the world with joy. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance towards you 
and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.